Hi everyone and welcome to Engaging Communities with Archives, a collaborative event hosted by the Digital Repository of Ireland and our friends at the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. So audience cameras are off and mics are muted, but we do encourage participation in the event using the webinar's interactive features. During the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions to today's speakers. To do so, just type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of the control panel. As time allows, the speakers will address as many questions as they can during the Q&A session at the end of the talks. You'll see the chat box is also enabled and you're very welcome to submit comments or feedback on the webinar through the chat. However, please use the Q&A feature to submit questions to the speakers as we won't be monitoring the chat for questions. We are recording this webinar and we'll share the link after the event. The event is also being live streamed to the DRI Facebook page. If you would like to join the conversation on Twitter, the hashtag is hashtag community collaborations. Um, so without further ado, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Laura Aguiar, the chair of today's event. Um, Laura is the community engagement officer and creative producer for the Making the Future project at Crony in Northern Ireland. She's a multimedia content creator and educator and works across the education, heritage and art sectors. And she's also the co-founder and co-director of the Rathmullen Film Festival. Um, so over to you now, Laura. Thank you, Anya. Can you all see and hear me okay? Yeah, great stuff. Uh, so thank you so much for the introduction and also for inviting Prony to co-host this webinar with the Digital Repository of Ireland. Welcome everyone uh, from whatever in the world you are. Uh, please feel free to say in the chat where you're based and also what you do and, and if you have any projects to share with us and, um, and any comments while the speakers um, share their presentations, please feel free to use the chat. And as Onya said, if you have a question, please put that in the Q&A um, box, not on the chat so that we can um, make sure that your question is asked after the presentations. So the aim of this webinar is to explore the idea of collaborating with CARE, and we will focus on participatory projects that are either training or supporting community groups in using video to tell personal stories, or projects that are bringing about uh, social change, or archiving and preserving activism and advocacy work, or doing the three things um, all together. So we hope that today's webinar will open up a conversation on how organizations can collaborate with care with community groups, as well as offer digital preservation support. So we're looking at both sort of like the creation and the preservation legacy side of, of, these, um, of these projects. We have three great guest speakers today. We have Liz Miller, who is a professor in communication studies at Concordia University, and she's going to be talking about um, new approaches to community collaborations and documentary making, and she's going to be sharing with us the wonderful Mapping Memories project. We also have Yvonne Eng from Witness, she's going to be talking about their work and also how they have supported people to use video as a tool for activism and advocacy. And we also um, have my colleague uh, from Prony, Lindsay Gillespie, who is going to be talking about a project that we have been involved in um, over the past three and a half years called Making the Future. And she's going to be sharing with you one particular project that we worked on um, earlier this year. So each speaker will have about 20 minutes and, uh, and then we're going to leave about 15 to 20 minutes for, for Q&A. So, and we're aiming to finish by half eight. So, um, so we're going to try to be a bit strict with time. So um, I'm going to be introducing each speaker properly, so before they come on. So without further ado, let's start with the first one. And we're going to go first with Lindsay. As I said, Lindsay Gillespie uh, is based in Prony. She's the archivist for Prony. And for those who don't know Prony, Prony is the public record office of Northern Ireland. And she's also the curator for the Making the Future project. So Lindsay has worked in Prony for the past eight years across a number of departments. So you can ask her absolutely any question about Prony. She will have the answer because she knows everything about Prony. And alongside her Making the Future role, she also leads the communication um, for Prony. She manages the website and also the social media uh, channels. And as I said, she's going to be talking about Making the Future and she's going to be focusing on one of our projects called Every Day is a School Day. And um, I'd like to take over from here, Lindsay. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, I don't know everything about Prony. I'll just make that clear now. I was getting really distracted there looking at everybody introducing themselves from so many different places. This is great. I'm um, just going to quickly share my screen and make sure that I've shared my sound as well. Good. Okay. 
So yeah, thank you all very much for having me here tonight, having Prony here tonight at this event. Um, I'm really excited to sort of talk about some work that we've been doing over the last three and a half years. Um, I'm just going to go really quickly through Prony itself, just in case anybody doesn't know what Prony is or what exactly it is that we do. Um, so Prony stands for the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, and it was created under the Public Records Act of 1923, which laid out archiving provision for the new state of Northern Ireland. Prony is currently located in the Titanic Quarter area of Belfast and has been for the last 10 years. Prony is the official archive for Northern Ireland, so that means that we, under this legislation, um, have a responsibility to bring in archive preserve and make available the records of the devolved administration in Northern Ireland, but essentially that just means the core civil service departments. But as well as that, we are also able to bring in privately deposited collections, which means we can accept anything from anyone that is an archive that relates to the heritage of Northern Ireland. Um, and that sort of unique double way that we receive records is key for us in, in two ways. A lot of the times it can affect people's perception of Prony. A lot of people believe that we are only a government archive or an institution of the state. And they're completely unaware that we can bring in private collections. But it also means that once we change that perception and we do make people aware that we can bring in private collections, it allows us to really encourage our communities to participate with us and become part of the records in Prony, and that will become clearer as I talk a little bit more through our project. So for the past three years, Prony has been a partner on the Making the Future project, um, and the Making the Future project tagline is everyone has a voice, everyone has a story, and everyone has a future. The Making the Future project, it was initially a three-year project. We've had a slight extension, um, mainly just due to COVID, and we all got a bit held up by COVID. But um, it's a three-year project supported by 1.82 million euro of EU funding under the Peace War program. So peace funding has been around in Northern Ireland for more than 20 years. Um, and we are, as I say, funded by the Peace War program. They have committed to another round of funding called Peace Plus, um, which is great. Um, there's even with Brexit, that we're going to continue to benefit from this EU funding. Um, but the, peace, the Making the Future project is funded under Peace 4. And it is led by a place called the Nerve Centre, which is a creative learning centre. Um, their main offices are in Derry in the northwest of Northern Ireland, but they have offices in Belfast as well. And they have brought together Prony as the official archive for Northern Ireland, National Museums Northern Ireland, and then the Lynn Hall Library, which is Belfast's oldest library. They brought us together as sort of the institutions that are holding the building blocks of our past and a lot of our heritage collections to bring communities together, to get them to engage with what's inside our collections, to see what our heritage actually is, how it's brought us to where we are now, and then what we want for the future. So to create a powerful vision for the future that's directly from communities. Um, so the project emphasis is really on cross-community engagement and um, skills building and the bringing together of collections and creativity. And it does this with sort of nine themes or strands of work. And um, so you can see them all on the screen there at the minute. Um, and the one that I'm going to be talking about tonight um, is one of the Prony strands, which is 100 Shared Stories. So for 100 Shared Stories, um, we had some sort of... Uh, loose guidance from the project um, plan as to what that was going to be. And then Laura and I have developed that further as we have begun to work on it. The aims and objectives really of the 100 Share Stories for us is to break down the barriers between communities and on what's in our archives, fill in gaps in our archives. So bring in records that we know are under, records and voices that we know are underrepresented in our archives and build Prony into a more participatory and inclusive archive and create shareable digital stories reflecting on the past, present and future of Northern Ireland. So for us in Prony, it's really about that sort of expansion and diversifying of not only our users, but our depositors and our collections as well. And for Laura and I, very much the emphasis throughout everything that we have done through the Making the Future project um, is on meaningful engagement. Um, and that's especially with groups and communities that we know don't actively engage with Prony as much, or whose stories are underrepresented in our archives. We've done just for 100 shared stories, nine programs so far with over 200 participants. And um, every project that we do is sort of loosely based under a theme. And um, because 
we had to sort of narrow the, it down a little bit and try to focus people. So we identified themes within the records and themes within life that we wanted to look at. So we've had gender and identity, migration, music and the arts. And the one I'm talking about tonight particularly was about education. And then we have done targeted recruitment to particular groups of people and communities that we know haven't been actively engaging with us and whose, as I said, voices are underrepresented. So that has included LGBT communities, minority ethnic communities, rural communities, and differently abled communities. And that's what I'm going to be speaking about a little bit more tonight. Um, through the Making the Future project, we have a set amount of hours that we have to engage with people with. Um, it was different in person. So when we used to engage in person before COVID, um, it was 26 hours per person before we could, we could consider them engaged. It's slightly lower um, and in around about 12 hours online because people just don't stick online as long. Um, but having that sort of set amount of hours allows enough time for that really meaningful engagement. So their meaningful engagement with us, but also their meaningful engagement with each other as people who take part in the project. And for us, meaningful engagement really is about giving voice to those individuals, groups um, and communities um, that, that haven't had that before, that representation particularly in Prony. Um, and obviously the theme for tonight is about collaborating with care. And I hope to show one example of how we've been able to do that over the last couple of years. So I'm going to be talking to you today then about Every Day is a School Day which is a program we ran with a group of people with varying degrees of sight loss. Um, and collaborating with care with anyone, with any group, um, for us often means good partnership, strong partnerships where you need them. Um, there is just Laura and I that work on this project for Prony, and we are only two people. And in order to get it right, to, especially when we're working with communities who have issues that we have absolutely no experience of, it's really important for us to partner with people who can ensure that we do collaborate carefully and meaningfully with these groups and that we do it properly. So with the Every Day is a School Day project, the first thing I will say is that we did it remotely during lockdown. So we started it in January of this year. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more detail as we go along and look at the activities, the sort of impact that working remotely had on the project itself. We knew loosely what our aims were for this education strand of 100 shared stories that we wanted to gather stories and experiences of education in Northern Ireland as people with sight loss and that we also wanted to learn how we could make Prony and the archives more accessible to people with sight loss or a visual impairment because we know we have a lot of work to do there as well. Um, the filmmaking element of it really came up in partnership with RNIB. I know the first time that Laura met Olive from RNIB um, we weren't entirely sure what we were going to do with them. We have done a lot of filmmaking programs through Making the Future and through sharing those examples and all of knowing that it was something the group had never had the chance to do before. Um, it was decided that we were going to make short films. Um, we met with the group on Zoom. So initially we had two Zoom sessions a week across four weeks and we had 10 participants um, and we recruited all of them via RNIB. We did also collaborate with a YouTuber called Connor Scott Gardner. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that further on and why that was important. Um, but certainly those two partnerships with the Royal National Institute of Blind People and Connor Scott Gardner as a, a YouTuber with sight loss um, were really important partnerships for us in order to be able to do it well. So part of every 100 Share Stories program that we do um, is looking at what we already have in the archives that reflects on the theme that we're looking at. So this one was about education. So we wanted to share some records with the group that reflect what Prony has already in its collections that tell us about education in Northern Ireland. But that's hard enough to do remotely when we're doing it with groups anyway. It involves a lot of scanning and when both Laura and I had lack, a lack of access to Prony due to COVID as well, never mind not being able to bring people in, we could barely get in through the door. Um, it was a more difficult process than we had initially anticipated when we designed the 100 Share Stories project. But then also because we were working with a group with sight loss, just scanning them and showing them through a presentation was never going to be enough for them to be able to engage with them. Because we were working remotely, um, it did make me quite sad. Remote engagement has its positivities in that we can reach more people all together at the same time when we're online than we maybe could if we were asking people to come to Prony or to come to a specific location. But I really felt with this group in particular that 
because we weren't able to bring them into the building and we weren't able to show them physical archives and um, they were they weren't even going to be able to experience archives in the same way that that everybody else does with those sort of touch and smell and sound element of archives we couldn't do that either so we were really sort of thinking outside the box as to how we were going to make them accessible so what we did in the end was work with a professional audio description company to get the archives that we had selected audio described for the group so that we could get them to engage with them as much as possible so that what we had selected from our archives so this little video is just a little example of what an audio description sounds like of an archive um I had picked this picture out of a school collection just because it's a picture of a nativity which most of us will have experienced at some shape or form when we were at school um being in the nativity watching the nativity whether you got one of the big parts and you were like you know Mary or you were just an angel or a star and one of you know 20 in the background um but this is just a little example of what that sounds like Document three is a photograph of the children dressed up for the nativity play. The photograph shows a mixture of boys and girls dressed up as angels, Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, the three wise men. The photograph is dated 1972. This is the end of the recording. Did it work that time? Yes. That's okay. Okay, great. Um, so that's just an example of an audio description. So we got that done with all of the records that we wanted to sh share with the group, just so that we were doing the same with them that we do with all the other groups that we work with. Um, and then we also did sort of a lot of two way workshops with the group. So we talked them through how Prony works in person when it's open. And also we had a, a workshop on how you can look at Prony records and do research online. And we got some feedback from them about how accessible or not accessible that was to them as people with sight loss. Um, and that in turn will hopefully help us make Prony more accessible in the future. So the first part of it was about making our archives accessible, but then the second part was about developing filmmaking skills. So myself and Laura and our colleagues in the Nerve Centre have been running filmmaking programmes the whole length of the Making the Future project. And we largely facilitate them ourselves because between us and the Nerve Centre, we have the skills and the tech to be able to teach these sort of basic filmmaking skills to our groups. But we were very aware that we were coming, that this script was going to be coming at the software and using the software in an entirely different way to how we use it. And at the beginning, we weren't even sure if a lot of the stuff that we would normally use with grips was even compatible for people with sight loss. So that was where the importance of our partnership and facilitation with Connor Scott Gardner came in. So Connor um, suffers from sight loss, quite severe sight loss but is a YouTuber as well, does lots of videos on YouTube about how people who are blind or have a visual impairment use things like smartphones um, and how they can use different types of filming software and cameras and tech and things like that. So lots and lots of videos on that. So it was really important for us to bring in someone that was very much speaking from their experience as we tried to teach them the skills. Um, and we were really glad to be able to work with Connor. And I would, I would encourage you to go and look at um, Connor's work. You can find Connor on Twitter as Connor Scott Gardner. If you're looking on YouTube, um, you would need to use Connor's former name, which was Holly Scott Gardner. Um, but Connor was a really important part of what we did and a really important part of sort of the facilitation speaking the language of our participants in a way that Laura and I might not have been able to do. And then we also did a lot of one-on-one -on -one check ins with each participant. So normally when we would get to the filming stage of a filmmaking program, we would sort of say, all right, we've done it. We've done all the all the training. Off you go and film your content. Um, we're here if you need us, you know, give us a shout. We're always here to help, but off you go. But with this group, we were very well aware that they might need a little bit more support. That they not, might not come to us if they were unsure about anything. So we did a lot of one on ones, even when they were off on the, the filming stage of the program. Um, Laura and I both say really very much in the end that the sight loss in the group wasn't the biggest hurdle that we faced. The biggest hurdle that we faced was working remotely with the group. It's very difficult to ensure that you are teaching people in the right way and being sure that they're picking it up when you're not with them in the room. So doing all of that remotely was much more the challenge really than them suffering from sight loss. Um, and Laura would say to them all the time, and I loved it, um, she would say, making a film is not about sight, it's about having a vision. And that was really important for us too, that the vision of the films would be theirs. So all of them decided what it was they were going to look at as far as education. 
on what education meant to them. And it's amazing that out of the 10 of them, they've all gone in very different directions. It's not just a story of going to school um, for each one of them. Every single one of them took it in a slightly different direction as to what education really had meant for them. So when we looked at it, like sort of why filmmaking and why was filmmaking um, an important tool for us to use and why do we use it so often with a lot of our groups? Um, and it's very much about um, the fact that film and video are an almost universally familiar and accepted digital medium. And there's so many ways to make film and video content accessible and shareable and engaging, no matter what somebody's abilities are or their background is, no matter what age they are. Um, there's lots of ways to make it accessible. And that's something we've been exploring increasingly through Making the Future as we continue to work with groups who have different abilities. Um, so there's lots of ways we find the ways to make it more engaging for someone who has sight loss. We know the ways to make it more accessible for someone who suffers from hearing loss. There are lots of different ways to make video more accessible for someone who is suffering from any type, type of disorder, whether it's to do with noise or vision or anything like that. People who are on the autism spectrum, there's different ways that you can make video more engaging for them. So we find it definitely to be that sort of universal way of making material engaging for people and sort of breaking down that barrier. And it also allows us, us to give the participants the opportunity to share their own stories in their own words, in their own way. So all we said was it's filmmaking. We tried to give them a time limit of which only one of them stuck to. Uh, you know, we were like, please no more than five minutes. Um, and only one person made a film that was under five minutes in time because they had so much to say. And we find that often with our groups as well. When we start, they'll be thinking, oh, I haven't got anything to say. Like nobody's gonna be interested. I couldn't make a film. I don't have a story to tell, but everybody does have a story to tell. And once you get started, it's amazing how much people have to say and how much people have to share. And the content that we got back from this group was so incredible that we totally dropped the time limit because we, we didn't mind at all because they had such powerful stories to tell and such interesting stories to tell. And I think that is probably the most important thing that we feel that we're doing is giving them voice to tell their own stories in their own way and gently bringing them into it, even no matter how much they think that they don't have a story to tell. I'm going to show you one little cut here. I'm just going to double check before I start that my sound is still sharing. Um, so I'm going to share with you one little cut of a film, um, but I think it really emphasises and shows exactly why this was important and it reflects very well on the type of films that were made. My name's Mark McShane and I am severely sight impaired blind. I'm 40 years old, and when I was 38 years old, I achieved a childhood dream. Uh, I'd wanted to graduate university. When I was 21, I started studying at university in Winchester. But things didn't work out too well there. I, I lost a sight in my right eye, and I had no sight in my left eye, so the sight loss took away a lot of confidence. Then, some years later, I started attending a place called the Cedar Foundation. So um, I learned to use screen reader software, a screen reader called JAWS. So that helped me build up some confidence. And then while I was there, a small course with the Open University to see if I could do it. I started working towards the degree. It's called an open degree. So I, I, I discovered early on that I liked law. I found it really interesting. So I transferred my degree to a law degree. I started my degree in February 2013. I think doing OU was the, was the best thing I ever did. The degree ceremony was in the waterfront in Belfast. It was the 5th of October 2018. Went and got my graduation gown I booked I'd hired a graduation gown for the event and when I put it on I felt the weight of it on my shoulders and I leaned down and put the bottom of it just above my ankle and I thought wow look what you've done look where you are you did it you're here I was showing up onto the stage, got the 
chance to walk across it before the ceremony. I was a bit nervous about walking across the stage and a bit nervous about walking places where I don't know. <laughs> so the ceremony started and my name was called eventually my name was called and I crossed the stage. Oh I felt so happy. If you watch the video you can see me waving. It's one of the best days. Graduation the degree ceremony day. So that's just um, a short cut of one of the films of um, one of our participants, Mark, and what it meant to him to be able to go to get a degree from the Open University um, and graduate. And through all of the programmes that we do with 100 Shared Stories, um, and particularly this one, um, all of our participants leave something with us for the archives at the end of the programme. And often, and very much like this one, they're truly personal stories to them that we are going to be archiving into the archives sort of forever. Peroni has a digital repository. So for us, that's great. It means that no matter what we create with people, we have a way of ensuring that we can look after it long term. So because each one of our participants has told their own story, for us, the number one important thing is that they felt empowered by being able to tell their own story and making their own film, even with sight loss. And that was particularly relevant with this group is that by the end of it, they could sit there and say that their visual impairment hadn't held them back from being able to make a short film and tell their own story at the same time. And that's certainly number one for us, but also for Prony, because they've left their own story with us, it gives them a personal connection to us that's ongoing. It's a meaningful connection to Prony, a meaningful connection to the archives, and therefore, a meaningful connection to the heritage of sort of our people and our place. And as they tell other people about that, then they're helping to advocate for Prony and for archives every day, having taken part in this program with us, because they will eventually encourage other people to do the same. So that's really important for us as well. So I'm going to finish with a video and Laura can feel free to step and tell me to cut it off if I if it takes me over time. Um, but it really just sums up what the experience was like um, for all of us. Um, and then at the end of it, I'll put up the website where you can view all of their films. Um, I wish we could show you them all now, but as I said, nobody kept to the time limit. So um, there are about two hours all in all if you watch all of them together. But we do have them all up on a website and I would encourage you to go and look at them because they will be, it'll be the best two hours that you spend this week, apart from this one. It'll be the best two hours that you spend this week. So please do check it out. It'll be at the end of the video and at the end of the presentation. But I will just play this video um, as the end of the presentation. Hi, my name is Olive Rogers and I'm the Community Access Worker with RNIB. When I first broached the subject about people with a sight impairment doing filmmaking, uh, everybody was going, mm, right, how do we go about this? Um, blind and partially sighted people making film. Some of us, including myself, had never made a video before and really didn't know how to go about it. The more the group talked, the more they sort of came together. The excitement within the group sort of grew. I think along the way it has been a great confidence builder and a great booster for the group. Uh, it's a chance to do things that they hadn't been able to do before. Uh, and all I can say is, is to thank you to both Prony and to the Nerve Centre for making this project um, such a great project uh, for everyone. So thank you. Well, like most things start with all of, we just get an email in our inbox. It sounded um interesting to make a film but um we had no clue it was nice to meet um new people again and laura and lindsay out of prony were just two incredible girls the amount of help and support they gave us during that project was just incredible my film was um about my primary school which is a tiny wee primary school out in county tyrone it was actually nice to think back, I contacted my cousins and my aunt and uncle who are still living in the area. And it was great to get their memories. It was good to see that, you know, um, visually impaired people, you know, can do the can do these things. So that was that was good. Oh hi, my name's um, Tim. 
and I got involved with the under um, short stories and initially like a lot of other folk um, a bit hesitant um, uncertain my story was about millions of art uh, that had a positive impact on my life what it didn't really something that I took for granted um, being able to see and to be able to draw and the benefits of art um, on my life then got taken away whenever I became physically impaired so the inclusion within the, the project has given me back once again I suppose confidence more confidence the learning that I got was simply that it doesn't make a matter what we face in life we can be included we can overcome so we can and we can enjoy um, learning new things think from you know I'm just going to stop that there and just so you all know Laura did text me and tell me that I could stop it when she started talking and um, because it was going to take me over time so thank you all very much um, for listening and please do that is the the website for all of the films in their entirety so please do go and check them out because we are very proud of them and very proud of our participants for for making them so thank you Thank you very much, um, Lindsay. It has been really a wonderful project and we will be going back to that at the end. So don't forget, if you have any questions for Lindsay, to put at the Q&A box um, here on Zoom and I'll make sure that uh, she answers your questions. So um, next speaker, we have Yvonne Eng from um, Witness. She is an audiovisual archivist and she manages the archives program for Witness where she trains and support partners on collecting, managing and preserving video documentation for human rights evidence and advocacy. As I said, she's gonna be talking about WITNESS, uh, which is an organization that helps human rights defenders use video to expose injustice. And in recent years, WITNESS has shifted its archiving focus from being primarily a repository for human rights video uh, to supporting human rights activists to create their own archives through training and resources. And their website has lots of amazing resources, which I'm really going through all of them because I wasn't aware of them before this webinar. Um, so I encourage everyone to, to ch check it out because it is really, really good. So she's going to be talking about witnesses work and how they support people to use video as a tool for activism and advocacy. Off you go, Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And hi, everyone. Thank you, DRI and Prony for having me. It's really great to be here. I'm calling in today from um, the Czech Republic. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen. And yeah, that, all of these overlapping things. Okay. Can you see my presentation? That's all good? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, so, so as Laura said, my name is Yvonne Ng. I manage the archives program at Witness. And um, yeah, so for my presentation today, I get, I'll start off just by giving sort of a, some context of sort of the human rights video documentation landscape. Um, I'll explain a bit more about how we work at Witness. And then I'll end with an example of an archiving collaboration that we've been part of for the last couple of years, oh, last, more than a couple of years, uh, last few years, with um, two um, grassroots cop watch organizations in the United States who are building um, databases for police accountability. So as, as Laura mentioned, um, just if you're not familiar with Witness, um, we're a nonprofit organization that helps people to use video and technology to protect and defend human rights. And I'll be talking a lot more about Witness as we go on. Um, but just, um, you know, in terms of the, the sort of the human rights video landscape, so we were founded in 1992. So we've been supporting activists to use video for almost 30 years now. Um, and during this time, the landscape for of human rights video documentation has changed um, a lot as of as as the, the way that that we work. Um, it, it's kind of hard to to remember now that even you know as, as much as as little as uh, fifteen to twenty years ago, not everybody had access um, to cameras and basic filmmaking skills. So at that time. You know, we were um, still hand distributing uh, camcorders to our partners, you know, conducting basic filmmaking and video advocacy trainings, and then, you know, coming back to 
you know, our, our office, our editing suite that you can see there and co-editing short form um, documentary advocacy videos with our partners that we would output to tape and then later to um, DVD. And that would be, you know, delivered to um, policymakers and, or courts as part of our um, advocacy um, strategies. And then also, and, and all of that footage and tapes and outputs would be archived at Witness. And so these are just a couple of uh, photos from sort of back in back in those days. Um, the one on the left is from a video we co-produced in 2001 with Joey Lozano and Nakamata, uh, an Indigenous um, coalition in the Philippines. Um, it was a video we made about um, uh, three Indigenous uh, leaders who were killed and a village that was attacked um, as they were pursuing their ancestral um, land claims um, on the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. And on the right there, is our one of our former video editors with um, our partner Drom in 2005, um, you know, co-editing a, a advocacy video on educational rights um, for Roma children um, in Bulgaria. So fast forward a bit to the end, near the end of the, the aughts, the 2000s, um, and we're starting to see the emergence of new digital video formats. YouTube and social media, smartphones and video on smartphones. And so the video, the, the use of video for documenting human rights abuses, you know, changes and grows um, dramatically. You know, so for example, um, you know, as we saw with Syria starting in 2011, citizen journalists starting to report on the conflict extensively, you know, at a time when international media and investigators can access the country. Um, it became probably the most um, documented conflict um, in history. It's been called the, 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 YouTube, um, the YouTube war just because of the millions of videos um, that were uploaded by, by witnesses to YouTube. Um, and then more recently, you know, as we've seen in the United States, um, we've seen how ubiquitous, ubiquitous cell phone video um, has been able to provide visual evidence um, of racist and violence policing um, and the systemic and, and sort of widespread um, nature of these um, injustices. Um, another significant um, development, um, you know, as people on the ground are capturing more and more of, of what's going on on their phones and uploading it to social media, is that um, human rights investigators and courts are increasingly turning to video and data collected from sources such as um, YouTube and Facebook to use as, as evidence. So um, at Witness, we published our first extensive guide on using videos evidence in 2015, um, and we've continued to build on this guidance over the years. Um, in the last few years, um, we've also seen the emergence of a, of a new field um, that's called um, digital open source investigations, um, which seeks to discover, analyze, and verify information um, that's um, often referred to as OSINT or open source intelligence, um, which is basically just information coming from publicly accessible sources, um, such as video posted on social media. So, you know, with all of these um, changes and developments, um, you know, there are, of course, new and ongoing um, threats and challenges to preserving um, human rights video documentation. Um, in term, first, in terms of the content, you know, just the immense volume of content you know, presents challenges for discovery and just um, information overload. Um, and then to, to deal with content that is like graphic or hateful, um, the social media platforms are in turn, you know, actively moderating and removing content, often with the assistance of like AI or automated tools, um, which then results in the removal of a lot of valuable human rights evidence as well. Um, you know, another challenge that I think we're all familiar with is the problem of the viral spread of misinformation and, and just the difficulty of determining the source or the veracity of information that's posted online. Um, and, and beyond the inherent um, precariousness of online information, um, repressive regimes are also continuing to persecute human rights defenders, trying to silence them, um, but now using new tactics like electronic surveillance, online misinformation campaigns, and internet shutdowns. So just for example, 
um, last year, one of our former partners from Cambodia, um, the venerable Luvan Sovat, um, he's pictured there. Um, he's also known as the, the multimedia monk um, because of the work that he does with, with video and multimedia. He was forced to leave um, the country after authorities mounted a smear campaign against him using Facebook um, to create like a, an, a, to impersonate him basically and to spread false information. And then on the right, um, you know, one of many, many examples of, of internet shutdowns, um, the Nigerian government has blocked Twitter, um, which is used by millions of Nigerians um, after Twitter deleted a tweet um, by the president um, who had posted um, something kind of calling for violence against um, an ethnic group in the southeast of the country. So in terms of archives, um, while there's always um, been community-based archives and activist-led um, archives, um, with all of these changes in the technological landscape, um, the increased reliance um, on, uh, on video as evidence, um, new threats and challenges, um, we've observed a really big um, growth in the interest in archives and archival methodologies um, over the last 10 years. Um, you know, in order to address these questions of how to save, manage, and, and keep secure um, collections of human rights videos. And I think there's also been a, a, an increased desire um, for communities to control um, their own their own archives, their own stories, to tell their own, to tell their own um, narratives from their own perspectives. So I just put on, on this slide some examples of some logos from some of our, our allies and, and their archival initiatives. Um, so with this sort of uh, context in mind, I, I now wanted to talk about um, Witness, the organization where I work, and, and how we now um, work with partners and communities um, to support their use of video um, for human rights documentation, evidence, and advocacy. Um, so our programs are organized by region. Um, we, have, we currently have programs in Southeast um, Asia Pacific, um, Middle East and North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Brazil, Latin America and the Caribbean, and uh, the United States. Um, we also have cross-regional programs um, in videos, evidence, technology, threats, and opportunities, and archives, which is me. Um, and, and across all of our programs, um, we're currently focused on the sort of broad thematic areas of um, serious international crimes, so genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes, um, state violence, and land defense. So this um, uh, slide here, this model is a visualization of sort of the overall way that we work. Um, sometimes we refer to it as our theory of change. Um, so starting at the top left, um, really important for us is um, to start with always listening and anticipating um, the needs and the gaps that people face when they turn to video. Um, you know, for instance, such as the understanding the archival needs, you know, across different regions and the thematic areas of our work. So this includes, um, you know, things that can't be overlooked, like this building relationships, being part of networks, um, participating in the conversations that are going on regionally, and in the thematic areas where we're working. Um, then another big part of our work is, um, for, after listening and anticipating, um, we collaborate for impact um, by directly partnering with local organizations and networks, um, often in multi-year um, projects um, to build capacity and skills to address gaps and to support their human rights advocacy. So for example, um, I would be involved in collaborations with partners when in, it involved like elements of uh, collecting, managing, or preserving video and data. So from there, um, we, synth we synthesize what we learn from this work and we create tools and guidance, um, such as our activist guide to archiving video, um, which uh, actually came out of the work that we did with Syrian activists um, back in 2013, as well as other um, um, short form resources like tip sheets or blog posts um, that we can share you know, widely with activists and groups all around the world. Um, and then finally, um, we then also advocate to larger systems 
that impact the ability of activists to use video safely and effectively for human rights, um, such as uh, tech companies and social media platforms. Um, so for instance, um, you know, contributing thinking around potential mechanisms for preserving human rights evidence that gets removed from social media platforms or um, uh, contributing thinking around you know, tech infrastructure or standards for uh, asserting the authenticity of digital content. Um, so now just for the rest of my presentation, I wanted to share an example of one of our current projects in the US um, that's centered around collaborative archiving for police accountability. Um, and to, to sort of help illustrate how our model uh, works for working with partners. Um, so in 2014, um, you may be aware uh, of the police killing of Eric Gardner um, in New York City that was caught on video. And then just one, one month later, um, the police killing of 18 uh, year old Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, you know, these led to massive nationwide protests um, in the United States and, and raising awareness around um, system, systemic racism um, in the country as well. Um, uh, during the protests, uh, video also uh, played a key role in documenting um, violence against protesters themselves um, and helping people to see um, what the mainstream media was uh, ignoring or getting wrong in, in telling the story of what happened. Um, so in the US, while many people have al were already um, filming police um, and doing you know, trainings on how to film, um, my colleagues in the US program were hearing from various groups about uh, the need for more support and guidance on how to manage and preserve that documentation. And also frustration that despite the existing documentation that showed you know, years of abusive policing practices and, and patterns, this, this narrative of the one bad apple um, still persisted and that stories of systemic abuse um, were being ignored. So then um, starting in 2016, um, we began a collaboration with the group um, El Grito to Sunset Park, um, who have been filming cops in their neighborhood for over 20 years. Um, Sunset Park is a largely Latinx and immigrant neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. Um, so while El Grito had a larger vision to eventually build a platform for receiving and preserving and publishing videos and, and reports, um, we sort of uh, decided to tackle a smaller part of that to help develop workflows for ingesting, analyzing, and preserving videos of police abuse using just a subset of their videos. Um, so videos captured during the Puerto Rican, Pride, uh, Puerto Rican Day Parade, um, which is a local event that had been met with severe police violence for over a decade. And then to experiment with ways to tell stories um, with the collection and the data um, that connect the dots on the patterns of, of misconduct and systemic abuse and the, and the institutional complicity of, of the NYPD. Um, this project also intended to draw attention to the lack of transparency um, uh, around New York state law enforcement and to share information about a law called Section 50A, which prevented records of uh, police records from being disclosed. Um, and actually, since, since we did this project um, and through the decades of, of work by grassroots organizers, the 50A law has um, actually been repealed. Um, so, so out of this collaboration, um, you know, we documented our process and learnings on a website called Profiling the Police. Um, you know, it, it includes a project planning workbook um, and a toolkit that has guidance on how we digitize the tapes, how we organize the files, how we describe the footage, um, and ideas for using um, the footage to, to tell stories about systemic abuse. Um, uh, our, our work with El Grito um, eventually also led us to a collaboration with another um, group called Berkeley Cop Watch. Uh, and Berkeley Cop Watch is a volunteer run community based group um, that's been around for 30 years in Berkeley, California. Um, they go out and do um, regular patrols to film and de escalate encounters with police. Um, and they receive footage and tips from community, community members 
Um, and they're really engaged in, in organizing with the houseless community around issues of gentrification, LGBT rights, mental health response, and racial justice. So Berkeley Cop Watch um, was interested in improving their database and archive system so that they could collect information about officers um, and show problematic practices um, and patterns over time. Um, they wanted to um, better capture the local historical knowledge that was being shared with them by community members. Um, and they wanted to be able to respond to inquiries from um, policymakers and journalists um, who were reaching out to them um, and to be able to respond in timely, um, organized and, and trustworthy ways. So we engaged in a, a collaborative training and development process with them over two years. And there's a, you can see a photo um, there on the, on the bottom right. Um, uh, to, to, so we engaged in this training to understand their needs and their objectives, um, and then to collaboratively um, design a database um, and to uh, develop an archival workflow um, for them to, to ensure that their video documentation was being collected and preserved. Um, and so we've developed the database and it's, it's since um, contributed to a campaign uh, leading to a problematic officer um, resigning from his job. Um, it's also been used in their organizing around getting police um, out of mental health response um, and engaging city, uh, city officials um, on the issue of, of, uh, of mental health, uh, uh, sort of emergency mental health response as well. Um, interestingly, another positive outcome of this collaborative design process that we undertook was that, you know, we were asking questions like, what do you want to ask the database? Like, what do you need to get out of the database? And that prompted Berkeley Cop Watch um, to sort of reflect really deeply about, you know, what they wanted to focus um, on uh, their efforts on as an organization as a whole um, going forward. So um, we were able to publish and share a number of resources um, from this project, um, including a FileMaker template, a version of the database, um, an extensive controlled vocabulary and data dictionary, um, diagrams of, of the data model and key reflections on the project. Um, we've also engaged in webinars um, and direct outreach um, with Berkeley CopWatch to other CopWatch uh, groups who are interested in adapting um, the materials and developing their own databases and, and archives. Um, we've also shared these resources um, beyond CopWatch organizations and outside of the US um, as, as they hopefully can be adapted to other contexts where um, people are doing advocacy against police violence um, or working on other issues um, that involve collecting and preserving um, data and video. And I just saw, <laughs> I just saw Laura pop up. So I think my time is up. So I can sort of, I can skip the last slide and I'll just, um, I have links to all of the, the uh, resources that I, I've shared here. So these slides will be shared with everyone afterwards. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvonne, and sorry for popping up my, my no screen there. Um, thank you very much. So we go now to our third um, guest speaker for the evening. We have Liz Miller from Concordia University in beautiful Montreal, Canada. She's a full professor in communication studies, as I said earlier, and she's also a brilliant documentary maker. And she's very interested in new approaches to community collaborations and to documentary making as a way to connect personal stories to larger social concerns. Her films and educational campaigns, they cover timely issues such as climate change, immigration, refugee rights, et cetera, et cetera. And they have won um, international awards. They have been integrated into international curricula and they have also influenced decision makers. She's the author, the co-author, sorry, of Going Public, the Art of Participatory Practice, which was launched in 2017. And she's gonna be, as I said earlier as well, she's gonna be talking about a brilliant project called Mapping Memories. Liz, I think you wrapped up the project in 2012, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, which was um, was actually the project that made me um, learn about Liz's work. Uh, it's, it's a fabulous project. And although it's finished in 2012, it's one of those that it's very inspiring and it's still very, very timely. And the way that the whole project came about, I think it's one of those that, um, Yes, you will replicate, you will get loads of ideas just from those uh, projects alone. The website is still operational, so uh, we're going to be sharing the link for, for the website where um, you can get loads of resources as well. 
So uh, the photos and the exhibitions and the videos from uh, that emerged from this project, they have been used to build uh, understanding about refugee rights and, uh, and also about the diversity of refugees' experiences in classrooms with decision makers and also with the larger public. And this project was actually part of a much wider project, an oral history project called Life Stories that engaged communities in documenting and archiving the life stories of those displaced by war and human rights abuses. So Liz, welcome and thank you for taking the time to speak to us tonight. Laura, thank you for that amazing um, overview. I really appreciate it. And I will just immediately share my screen uh, so I can get going. Actually, I'm gonna stop for one second. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I just want to begin by saying uh, what a privilege it is to be in the company of um, these two projects and I see all of these uh, interesting and compelling um, connections between the three projects. So I'm really excited uh, for our discussion as well. But as Laura introduced, I uh, initiated in 2007, which already seems like uh, econs ago, uh, mapping memories, participatory media, place-based stories, and refugee youth. And it was a participatory media project. It was a five-year collaborative media project that involved 10 workshops involving over about 180 youth participants with refugee experience. I am a professor at Concordia University in Communication Studies. So it was really a university community collaboration. Our funding came um, through the university. And we were situated at a center called the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling at Concordia, which is CODES, which is a resource I hope uh, anybody uh, may already know of or will go visit. Our intention was to build understanding about youth with refugee experience uh, by, through this participatory methods. And our approach was that I had seen and been a part of many different participatory media projects in the creation phase. And I was really interested in how we might push that into the advocacy stage so that all the youth that were creating stories to build awareness in the city were also the same individuals sharing those stories in classrooms, in buses, uh, in subways, and all of the venues that we found. So I was really interested that participation not end in the co-creation, but it was also a huge part in the dissemination. And uh, just in conversation with these other two projects, I was thinking about how this project is really kind of an example of the gift of longevity. I want to speak about how archives, platforms, participation, um, and participants evolve over time. So hopefully I'll get to that. And I'm also going to just mention a couple of the tensions that we address, because I think sometimes it's really important to share those experiences. But just to offer this overview, so we involved a lot of different methods um, as I was saying, this was very participatory, um, but we also did, we had an oral history approach where we used the method of life stories. This is an interview methodology of doing interviews with someone that can range from two hours to eight hours. Uh, we used documentary where we were documenting both our process and uh, the, some of the different groups that we were working with. We used the method of digital storytelling. So we worked with youth to create these four to six minute self-authored films. We used lots of um, mapping that were emerging at the time and tried out um, platforms so that we could map place to story. We did live sound walks, so we had guided tours through neighborhoods, we had bus tours. So we were really kind of trying to figure out this creative um, process of both co-creation and creative dissemination of these stories. As um, others have said, the development of partnerships uh, was super important to us. And so we had advocacy partners, we had educational partners, we had service partners, and we had this other larger partner at the university, which is uh, this larger project that I'm gonna to touch base on uh, briefly. But it was all of these partners together and their different expertise that I think made this project so um, longstanding. Um, a lot of the process of mapping memories, we documented in this book that is free and available online. And we kind of organized it uh, in chapters through the different iterations. I mentioned that we had these 10 different workshops 
and each workshop was very different. So we had uh, one day workshops over the period of a year with a place called the Montreal City Mission, which was a shelter for newcomers to the city, primarily male um, identified newcomers. We had, um, and I'll just briefly say, one of the, um, the coordinator of the Montreal City Mission was, you know, explained to us how all of these men from all over the world come and have to live together. And he wanted to, he wanted to work together with this digital storytelling to create a sense of tolerance, especially for LGBTQ concerns within the home. Um, so we did these one day workshops over a year. We uh, worked with a shelter that was primarily uh, working with women. So in this particular module, we worked over a period of 13 different weeks and the end uh, was a bus tour. So each, each workshop iteration really depended on the needs and conditions of the partner. Uh, we did weekend workshops with another center uh, in one of the neighborhoods, a youth center who were primarily interested in thinking about music as a way of um, engaging youth. So we, we worked with uh, hip hop artists and um, wrote lyrics. So both the form and the format was uh, shifting quite a lot. And we also worked with a group in um, Toronto that was primarily offering services to refugees um, with LGBTQ uh, backgrounds who had fled their countries based on persecution because of their sexual orientation. Um, and in this initiative, we uh, really worked with walking tours, places in the city where they felt safe, and then mapped these and in interactive platforms online. And I just wanted to mention like one of the values that really kind of guided uh, the, the initiative was this idea of reframing refugee narratives and a kind of uh, responsiveness to the fact that the form should really match the needs of the participants. This was a particular workshop where we asked participants to start with the application that they'd filled out to get into the country, which is so often a victim narrative and to fill in the application with things that they felt they could not have said at the time. It was a really fun, interesting way to instigate this dialogue that um, was throughout the process about the kind of reframing of refugee narratives from one of victimization to one of resilience um, and complexity. And I'm just gonna play a short clip um, that I hope communicates this uh, in intention that we had of um, both the co-creation of stories but the creative dissemination of stories and so this is Leontine who is uh, presenting at one of the 20 schools um, where we took these stories afterwards so. okay so everyone has a story and we have different stories that was Stephanie's story and my story starts at the age of eight I was a little younger than you I was born in a normal family with uh, three sisters and uh, two brothers. And one day, one night, everything changed. That was genocide of Rwanda. Someone came running and told us that our tribe is being killed. And uh, our father told us to leave their home and find the way to escape. My mother prepares something to eat. My brother and I are sitting outside. The rest of my family, my father, mother, sister, and brother are inside. A lady comes running towards us. She seems crazy. She tells us that they are killing people. We start running. I follow my brother. We go into woods. We stay there for hours. Then we move to another forest and we find our father. But he tells us to leave. It is not safe. Uh, at the beginning, it wasn't easy to, to tell a story. I had many stories in mind. I wanted to tell other people's stories, not my story. But after I started once upon a time, there was a little girl. If she wasn't alive, who could tell this story? Who could remember her family? I want to Okay, so uh, that cut a bit short, uh, but it was is basically a uh, Leontine um, kind of discussing her experience um, doing this school tour. Um, so let's continue here. 
Oops. And uh, so basically, after this five-year period, we were left with uh, more than 30 first-person digital stories and documentaries, uh, an amazing archive of life story interviews. So each participant did both a digital story and a life story, uh, French and English books for teachers organizations, for teachers and organizers who might want to um, initiate uh, projects like this as well. Definitely thinking about this theme today of collaborating with CARE. Uh, we did these school tours and film screenings and gallery and museum exhibits, bus and walking tours. And we even uh, had a subway campaign where some of the oral history clips um, were accessible through a QR code. I know that's really old school technology now. Um, and as I had mentioned briefly, this project was connected to a larger oral history initiative that was directed by Steve High, and he um, discusses this project in, in great depth and in oral history at the crossroads. It's a really amazing um, uh, document of this uh, larger initiative in which um, in which we were the youth arm of this larger initiative. So there were community organizers and university professors involved. We engaged the Rwandan, Haiti, and Cambodian communities, um, taught them in audio filmmaking and the methodology of the life story. Um, this initiative, this five-year initiative, and if I'm not being clear about it, um, the Mapping Memories became the youth arm of that wider initiative. Um, and this particular Life Stories initiative resulted in 500 interviews uh, that became an archive in itself. I like to say in addition to interviews, there were also marriages and friendships and a whole range of other relationships that came out of this unbelievable initiative. Um, and um, both of these books, uh, Oral History of the Crossroads and Going Public, kind of discuss in detail uh, that process. And so these two projects were really connected. And what I wanted to kind of touch on today is then what happened, because as Laura said, this is a project that has that that, that took place in the past, but that has had a kind of uh, compelling legacy. Um, so in 2016, Steve um, reinitiated a new project, which was called the Living Archives. And basically from that archive, so there were 500 oral history stories, the life stories, which is a massive collection. And from that, 29 individuals from the Rwandan community who had initiated their own community archive as a result of this larger project um, decided they wanted to be part of a, a, a second um, project called Living Archives. And this second project was really about the creative use of archives and thinking about how um, there, there could be a platform for the next generation of oral histories to think about what is listening? What is sustained listening? But also to provide this public resource for survivor communities. And this was a result of a deep partnership of this long-standing partnership between uh, the Rwandan community as represented through Paj Rwanda and this oral history center. Um, so there's been a, a, a real longevity in the project. Another offshoot of that Life Stories project was the Atlas of Rwandan Life Stories. And this resulted in a um, Atlas Cine, which is an open access tool to map life stories um, into um, a sort of more spatialized context. And this was developed by Sebastian Kakard. Um, so I wanted to, that was the overview of, um, of the initiative. And I just wanted to touch base on some of the tensions that we negotiated over this legacy, over this long-term period. The first, and I think many of the other groups will probably attest to this, was this kind of tension between an, Im an intimate process um, and engagement of the members of the community versus this long-term archival quality. So to share what I mean by that through an anecdote, in the beginning, I know the Rwandan, um, we, we thought about who should be in on this interview. Should it be two Rwandan community members who were learning audio for the first time who might feel a little stressed out about um, operating the equipment? Or did we want to place a professional uh, filmmaker or uh, audio maker in the room so that they didn't have to think about, um, about the technology? In the end, we decided that it was more important to emphasize the intimate conversation. But in retrospect, five years later, some of the quality of the interviews were not as high. And um, 
the community was unable to feel good about using those interviews. So I think there's always a tension about um, engaging people deeply in the process versus the long-term archival quality of the work. It's not something that we resolved uh, easily, but it's something that we really wanted to share with uh, other people. Another tension, of course, Witness is super aware of this, and I have learned so much from Witness, uh, and shout out to Yvonne and the important ongoing work, but is the idea of outreach versus privacy and immediate safety. So this was something that we were constantly negotiating with participants, um, was this idea of this is, this is the representation that will go into a long-term archive versus how can we make sure that we protect uh, your immediate safety. So sometimes um, strategies of aesthetics were important to discuss and enact. Another tension was uh, this idea of what, what we came to sort of joke about, the short narrative unit versus the long narrative unit. And the life story is what I'll call the long narrative unit. As I mentioned before, it's an interview that can range anywhere from two hours to eight hours. Um, but we all know that we live in a world with very short attention spans. So we would have really meaningful dialogues about how we could create a platform that would um, feature both of those forms. So that, for example, Leontine uh, was telling her story for the very first time. Her adopted mother had actually never heard her life story because she had never had the courage to speak it out loud. And so, of course, her adopted mother would want to hear her Rwandan adopted mother would want to hear the entire six hours of her interview, but in a classroom, um, high school classroom, we would resort to these shorter narrative units. And so really uh, just speaking to the tension and how one of the ways that we resolved that was really featuring different platforms so that different audiences and their needs would be taken into account. Um, a fourth tension was the idea of where to share these stories um, aesthetics, access, ownership, what platforms are you using that are already out there uh, versus what platforms do you have the resources to develop? And I think everybody in this group would have a lot to say about that, but these are obviously very important questions to think through from the beginning of any initiative. And um, the last tension I wanted to mention was sort of this tension of longevity. Um, of course, we were working with youth who were sort of at the beginning of their lives and who'd undergone these traumatic circumstances um, but lives change and the desire and, and our stories change consent changes over time and participation changes over time so um, we worked with about 180 different youth participants over this period of five years but over a 10-year period we had a sustained commitment of about three and who really like wanted to continue speaking in schools and in human rights contexts. And similarly with the Living Archives of Rwanda, I mentioned that huge figure of 500 uh, participants, but it was the Rwandan uh, community group who was the most excited about initiating their own community archive. There were 89 um, um, life story testimonies in that archive, but to take it to this very public stage five years later, uh, we had to revisit consent and it was 29 individuals decided to take it to the next stage to the living archives. So just a sort of cue that, uh, that lives change, consent and participation change over time. Um, and uh, I just wanted to end by saying um, that, you know, I'm, I'm eager to talk about this idea of collaborating with care. Uh, I loved um, this idea of strong partnerships the one-on-one -on -one consultation. We integrated a lot of food into our process and um, I hope that we can continue to discuss this more. I think I've reached my time. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, you're actually two minutes earlier because we started a little <laughs> bit later. Um, thank you so much for that. So maybe uh, could I ask all the speakers to turn your cameras on so we can see you. And um, yeah, there are a couple of questions here on the chat. I'm actually going to the first question was for Lindsay, but I actually think it works well for the three speakers. So because collaboration with care and partnerships have really featured uh, on the three presentations really, really well, um, can the three of you talk a little bit more about how do you get the word out to the partners? Do the partners generally come to you or do you go to the partners? And, um, and as a, tell us a little bit more about the recruitment process for these partners to take part in your projects. So maybe we can start with Lindsay and then we go to Yvonne and then to Liz. 
So Lindsay, can you tell us a little bit more about the case for making the future? Uh, yeah, well, we get um, sort of our groups and participants uh, from lots of different places for making the future. Um, for every day is a school day, um, sort of came about nearly from multiple places, really. Um, way back, sort of in the first phase of our project for making the future, we had done a program that was to do with a, a trail map in a local cemetery. And um, we had made it into a paper app and a, or a paper based thing and then an app that had audio on it. And when we did a public tour of it, um, some participants from RNIB came to it. So Olive brought her group to a tour that we were taking and she spoke to us in depth about how impressed she was that the audio was included to make it accessible for people with sight loss issues. So she was aware of what we were doing. And then earlier this year, in a bid to sort of like drum up recruitment while we were having to work online and not able to get out, we had done an online information evening across all of the partners from the Making the Future project. And Olive came to that. And then through that, she came to us and we designed that program together with her. Um, and across Making the Future, we've done it in lots of different ways. Sometimes, particularly now, Laura and I are targeting recruitment. So we know that we are looking for those sort of underrepresented voices and stories from the archives. And when we're doing that, we are very careful to do that through partnerships. So when we were doing sort of LGBT programs, we went to local support organizations to build that trust with communities and people is, is to go through an organization that they trust so that they are willing to come on board with you. And similarly with the minority ethnic communities, we went to support organizations for them. When we did rural communities, we worked with the rural community network to gather the participants in. So the partnership was really important. And um, previously to that, we have just sort of gone out, gone to communities, contacted local community centers and asked to come and just get in front of people and talk and say, we'd love to work with you. What could we do together? And then other times, Laura and I have sat in the offices and designed a program of something we think would be interesting and just put it out across social media and had people come in and join us. So we've done it in lots of different ways to get the participants on board. It really depends on what you're doing and why you're doing it. And particularly when we're thinking about that collaboration with care, if you're asking for people to tell you a very personal story to them, then it's important, I think, to work sort of slowly. It's about building that trust and building those bridges first to get them in through the door. And, the best way to do that is to go to organizations maybe that they already do trust. Thank you. And I think that's more the case because we're coming from PRONI, which is the official archives for Northern Ireland, which has many different perceptions about what PRONI is and what PRONI does. So building that trust through those groups uh, has been essential for us to get people through the door. Um, Yvonne, what was your what is your experience like in recruiting partners? Was very impressive with the map showing that witness is almost everywhere. Um, so how do you do that? Um, I mean, just to echo what Lindsay is saying in terms of building trust. I mean, I think our partnerships kind of come out of that listening and anticipating step in our in our map. So like we're we're part of these conversations, we're part of these communities, part of these networks, and so like I think the partnerships kind of emerge like both like organically but intentionally so it's like you know you know there it's a there's a potential partnership but like and they there's trust but like are we a good fit like do we fulfill like do we fill the gaps that they have or are they better served by working by, with somebody else and like you know looking at our our capacity looking at our thematic areas looking at where we have regional representation and whether you know what we can provide is what is needed um and then you know often comes from from you know, working like a partner might come from from another partner. So like with Berkeley Cop Watch, you know, we we've been sort of being like, uh, like done webinars with other Cop Watch groups. Um, you know, doing conversations with with other Cop Watch groups that know Berkeley Cop Watch and maybe want to adapt what we've done with them. So sort of like that might that may or may not you know turn into like another partnership down the line. So what about yourself, Liz? I know that in the first slide, you mentioned some of the partners you worked with and they helped you with the recruitment of participants. Did you, did you go to them? Did they come to you? How did that work? Yeah, I love this question because I feel like, uh, like Prony, uh, I think partnerships was the primary way that we did our recruitment. And I'll just admit that it took about a year to do a really intensive survey of the intersection of who was working, who was offering services for refugee, uh, individuals with refugee experience in Montreal, who was doing digital story and media with youth in the city and who was doing um, kind of advocacy work. And we, it was a really deep dive into visiting and talking with all of these different groups. 
and then seeing kind of like what Yvonne is saying, where the needs were. And if like, we certainly didn't want to impose anything on anybody. Mm. So it was really trying to fill in the gaps. And I had this idea that we would find one partner organization and that it would be really in depth. And instead what I found was that I had to go with the flow and kind of work with a, a patchwork of groups who had different kinds of needs. So what we thought we were gonna do versus what we ended up doing was radically different and it was because we had a sort of care-based responsive approach but that one year sort of deep dive into understanding what was already happening was essential and i love how yvonne at witnesses talks about that as uh, the listening and sensing part of, of, of the initiative i think what's common between the three projects is the whole idea of listening with care as well that the partnership will never work if there is no sort of like deep listening whenever you're having these conversations about what the project could look like. Um, so it's, it's very much a two way thing. So it's, it's beneficial for all partners involved, not just for Prony or for Concordia or for Witness. It is, um, it's something that is mutually um, beneficial. Right, my God, we have so many questions and not enough time. So I'm gonna try uh, to answer as many as we can. Uh, there was a question here for Lindsay uh, from Christina Quinlan. Um, she was saying there is a, such a symbiosis for every person involved in storytelling and particular in relation to telling their own story. So each person has to choose which story of the very many stories that they might choose to tell about themselves and each will learn so much about their own story while they're telling um, their story. There's a lot of story in, in that sentence. Uh, did you have that experience, uh, particularly in the Every Day uh, is a School Day project that the more people told stories, the more they wanted to tell more stories? Definitely, yeah. I mean, through the Making the Future project, and obviously when we're asking people to tell their stories, we are sort of, you know, we end up do having to sort of guide people. So every day as a school day was about education. So we were asking people to discuss education with us. Um, and you know yourself, Laura, no matter who we start with here in Northern Ireland, for some reason, their first reaction is always like, oh, no, I have nothing to say. I have no story to tell. Nobody's going to want to listen to me. And then once you get them started, they have a lot to tell and it's very reflected I think in 100 shared stories as to the different ways that people approached education even the sort of three participants that were in my presentation so Marx was about the open university and sort of going back as a mature student um, and having sight loss Patricia's was about her experience of primary school and her whole family's experience of that primary school and um, and then Jim's was very much about art and its influence on his life and how it's encouraged him in education so they all had a slightly different viewpoint about what education was some of them talked about travel as education not about going to school or going to university or anything like that so there's definitely you know everybody has something that they want to tell you and you know we set a time limit saying oh could you make your film less than five minutes one person one person was able to make it less than five minutes everybody else once they started you know sent it in their content had like 20 25 minutes worth of stuff to tell us that they wanted to tell us and then as you say as this says, you go with the flow you say all right well that's it yeah we're gonna have way more way more content than we initially thought this is going to be way longer but it's all great it's all worth doing it's what they want to tell us so we'll go with it and I think that's kind of, it's it's balancing that between you could tell us anything you like and that could take us forever to get people to think about what they're going to tell us and, and put it all together. So giving them that sort of loose theme, education, we want to talk about education and then all the different ways that they took that off, I think was sort of a good balance for that one. And I think it goes back to Liz's point about the tensions between the, the short format and the longer format as well, that you want to make sure you capture as many stories as you can and as much as you can from that particular story. But how do you repackage that so that it, it is an interesting for an archive, for an audience, for the different platforms that that story will, will feature? Um, thank you. Next question is for um, Yvonne from Claire Lanigan. Um, in the Ber Berkeley Copwatch project, did you develop a unique vocabulary for that collection or did you modify an existing one? So yeah, it, we did have unique vocabularies um, for it. And, you know, it was a, a balance between like, you know, wanting to use like community definitions of terms rather than like state definitions, but and then also like thinking about like, what, what do you want to ask the database? So like, what terms do you need to use in order to get, to do the queries to get the, the answers you want? Um, I think also like what data did the Berkeley Copwatch realistically have access to and could get to put into the database was another consideration. Um, but you know, this, it was like a very long 
you know, process. So like not even just determining what terms to use. So let's say like for use of force tags or something, but like the meaning of those terms. And then for other fields where like the terms themselves like might not be that hard to understand, like under, like understanding how to apply those terms. So like race or gender of like, you know, of a of a survivor or of of a police officer, how do you even determine that? And like how, like how do you train people on how like how to fill that out? Um, and and you know going back to Lindsay's point about the, the the challenges of doing like online versus in person, you know this this was like a process like building those vocabularies took like days of like you know sitting together lying on the floor like Liz you mentioned food like it was like this very very drawn out process and i don't know how you would even i don't know how we would have done that if we had to do that um online to be honest yeah i think online makes everything 10 times harder um but absolutely anything um thank you okay next question is for yvonne and liz uh how and i think liz you touched upon it whenever um during your presentation how do you deal with the privacy of people who appear in photographs or videos but may not give uh, may not have given their consent or may not be aware of the video projects? And have you ever had security concerns in the process of sharing these stories? And that's from Emily Burton. So maybe Liz, do you wanna go first? Well, yes, I mean, I feel like in really good company be, to be talking uh, with Yvonne. We, um, we at Concordia had the privilege of collaborating with Yvonne on a video advocacy institute um, over a decade ago. And everything I know about security has come through um, that collaboration through Witness. And, and basically, we were really, really careful. Um, so there, my whole relationship to consent is that it's not a one-off. It's ongoing. It needs to be checked consistently. And it's always best to go with the most secure way forward. So if there were any questions at all about anybody in a photograph who didn't want to be in the photograph, we wouldn't use it. So we went for really... Um, especially like in the digital stories, we primarily, we, we brought in a photographer who just uh, did a series of stills uh, with, with the individuals, which were phenomenal for um, PR later, but it was also kind of a, a body of work that the um, participants could use, you know, if we needed to rely on the simplicity of a still image. So really trying to think of like um, less is more, that the story itself was really where the weight of the piece was. And that if there were any questions at all about anybody else in those images, that it was just easier to forego that. But the project itself was primarily for individuals who were ready to share their stories in the public, because um, that can be a really big ethical issue as well. And um, I'll just sort of end by saying, I think for me, the most important thing I learned about collaboration, and I, I'm imagining um, that Lindsay would, would agree with me, was about the peer relationships. Like, I really spent a lot of time offering spaces for participants to connect with each other, because I think they gave each other the courage to continue um, to decide to share these stories uh, publicly. So there's multiple stages, consent is ongoing, and it can change and you need to be ready you need to be ready if somebody changes there which is really challenging especially if like you've published something in a book Yvonne do you want to follow up sure I mean I would echo everything that Liz says and, I, and Liz actually your association with witness like predates me <laughs> so you've been around you with witness longer than I have um but um yeah I think you know, I, you know, as Liz sort of alluded to, every situation is different. So I think like I mean, security is like a first and foremost like consideration in everything that we do. And I think there just has to be like a assessment, a risk assessment for every situation. It's going to be different. I mean, we do try to share um, tips on like what people should think about, like, you know, what questions to ask yourself if you're going to use a certain app or like um, just to be aware, like, you know, the photo is not just you know, the image of the photo, but there's metadata as well. So you need to think about what metadata like you might be sharing when you share the photo or video, that kind of thing. Um, but it re yeah, it really is like kind of having that knowledge and then doing your own assessment. Thank you. I'm conscious of time. Um, if everyone is okay, we're just gonna go five minutes over time so we can answer two more questions. And I'm sorry for the other ones who uh, popped their questions into the Q&A, we won't have time for them or we might, but let's try with the first two and then see how, how we go. Um, Orla Egan from the Core College BT Archive has a question for Liz about the platforms. Which platforms did you use for your project, Liz? 
So um, as I said in the presentations, for our projects, both the platforms, the participants, the consent, the ethics, a lot of this changed over time. So my approach uh, in a lot of these big participatory projects is to start with something that people know and kind of pilot it, something that people uh, feel comfortable using on their own, do small pilots before uh, finding the funding and the big money to make like the make your own platform. Um, so that can have uh, disadvantages. So for example, when we were making that project, we began using Drupal, which I'm not using anymore. Then we moved into WordPress. Uh, we were using Google Map at the time because it was, this is how much I date myself. It was like at the, at the um, onset of Google Mapping. Um, so it's really, I think about being um, flexible but making sure that uh, Yvonne would be able to give everybody a, a workshop, making sure that you've archived your materials well so that you can be flexible, just to sort of short story. We had initially put all of our videos into this moving images platform called Blip. I don't know if anybody remembers that name. It folded, it folded overnight, you know? So basically we went from having this vibrant online archive to nothing. So, <laughs> so take a workshop with Yvonne <laughs> and anyone who's here in, in the archive world, because you, you really have to, I think, be fluid and flexible if you're using um, platforms that you haven't developed yourself. And the problem with developing your own platform, of course, is the cost. And can you actually maintain it? Like, do you have the infrastructure? And I, I t you know, it's really like thinking 10 years, 20 years in advance. Um, anytime I'm working with a program programmer, I like to ask them, like, what's the, what do you imagine is the life space of this? For example, Flash was uh, a software that that you know we were using a lot and overnight uh not overnight but of course flash came and went and so um really thinking about um multiple platforms i think is kind of the most conservative way forward yeah and also i think there's this whole idea of long-term preservation um it, it's really important it's something that definitely Lindsay and i uh, we're using a lot of Wix to, uh, as, as the platform to host a lot of the stories that we're collecting and to showcase the work that we have been doing. And uh, one of the big discussions that we have within Crony is that's brilliant for now, but will it be accessible in, in the long run as well? So as well as, 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 well as choosing a, a safe platform to collect the stories, think about the long-term preservation as well. So it's not just about collecting or showcasing, but also preserving the, the stories. Okay. Um, Last question um, from um, Camion Caballero, hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, for someone who is starting out to, you know, in a storytelling project, what advice would you give to someone running a volunteer short filmmaking program, most likely online for the very first time? So if you were to give any sound advice, so maybe we'll start with Lindsay, we go to Yvonne and Liz, um, so you can all think about um, if you were to give the one advice for someone who is starting a filmmak filmmaking project and online. What would you tell them to do? Um, find a good partner. To do, if you don't have the skills yourself, I mean, a lot of, as you know, Laura, a lot of what we've done has been really enhanced by the partnership with the Nerve Centre within that project, and um, because they do that all the time. Um, but aside from partnership, um, I think probably the other one is it's patience and perseverance because at the start, it might feel like it's it's a mountain that not everybody's gonna make it to the top of, um, you know, but they will. And online, it, it is so much harder. As I said, you have no idea if you really are explaining something properly to someone, if you cannot stand over the shoulder and watch, watch them do it and know that they've got it um, when you're just talking online. And hoping for the best and a lot of people can just say yeah 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 totally yeah got it got it no problem and then go off you know log off the zoom call and they're going ah, i haven't got a clue don't know what i'm doing um so i say aside if you can't if you can't find a good partner and you're starting it from scratch um the most important thing is patience and perseverance and that you know your participants will need that too because certainly all of ours at the start were you know oh we'll never be able to do this like, i've never done anything like this before you know good luck to you um but in the end, absolutely every single one of them did it. Now, to varying different degrees, some of them did everything from capturing the content, scripting it, to editing it. Other people maybe just captured all the content, did a bit of filming, and we did the editing for them because, you know, that was beyond what, what they were wanted to be capable of, felt comfortable doing. Um, so I think that's part of it too, in your patience with people, is understanding when they've reached their limit and where you might have to step in and do a little bit more of the work for them. Thank you. Yvonne? I guess similar to Lindsay, I guess I would say like getting the, the right people 
in, in taking part in the training is just like really important, like assessing, like assessing beforehand and, and selecting the right participants who are people who really get something out of it and who are really invested. Um, I guess the only other thing I would add is like accounting for different learning styles and ways of like maybe having exercises and different different types of exercises um, for different uh, learners. Yeah. Liz? Uh, well, I really like what everybody else has said. I guess the last thing I would add is um, relationships, like really making space so that everyone who's involved they, is is kind of connecting to each other, because I think that's where a lot of the power of this uh, comes in. And uh, that trust, trust is a really sacred thing in, in these kind of processes and never underestimate. Um, it takes time to build trust. Thank you. So I hope um, you have enough to get started with your own project. Um, so um, thank you very much, uh, Liz, Lindsay and Yvonne for taking the time to speak with us this evening. It has been absolutely brilliant. Thank you everyone who engaged in the chat and also who submitted your questions on the Q&A. And I'm very sorry, there are a few questions that, that couldn't be answered. But um, uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Anya and Deborah and everyone at DRI for inviting Prony to be part of this event.